The Mystery of the Alaska Triangle There are certain areas of this planet that seem to be magnets for missing persons and mysterious disappearances. For whatever reasons, people come to such places and simply vanish, never to return. Many know of the more famous of these places, such as the Bermuda Triangle, but there are more such anomalous zones to be found around the world. Perhaps one of the more little known of these regions that are seemingly hungry for more souls is a vast expanse of wilderness in the northernmost US state of Alaska, a cold, barren place that has the habit of holding on to people and refusing to let go. Alaska's Bermuda Triangle is said to encompass a large, sprawling section of the state, all the way from the southeastern region near Juneau and Yakutat, and all the way up to the North Barrow Mountain Range and to Anchorage in the middle of the state. Within this zone are vast areas of largely unexplored wilderness, including sprawling forests, craggy mountain peaks, and desolate, barren tundra. The region sports an unusually high number of people, both tourists and locals, who go missing every year without a trace, as if they have vanished off the face of the earth. And additionally, many planes have also disappeared, or inexplicably crashed here. It is said that since 1988, a staggering 16,000 people have vanished in the so-called Alaska Triangle, to never be heard from again. One of the most high-profile, mysterious disappearances within the Alaska Triangle occurred in October 1972, when an airplane carrying none other than two prominent politicians, House Majority Leader Hale Boggs and Representative Nick Begich, along with an aide, Russell Brown, and their bush pilot, Don Johns, mysteriously vanished in the region while on the way from Anchorage to Juneau aboard a Cessna 310 aircraft. The disappearance of such prestigious public figures sparked an intense search that lasted for 39 days and involved over 400 aircraft, including an advanced Air Force SR-71 and dozens of boats, including 12 from the Coast Guard. Yet no evidence of what happened to the free men or the plane was ever found, and the men were declared dead. The disappearance actually sparked some conspiracy theories at the time, with some people claiming that the crash had been orchestrated, or at least was covered up by the head of the FBI at the time, J. Edgar Hoover, in response to intense power struggles that he had with Box. To this day, no trace of the men or the plane, not so much as a bolt or scrap of metal, has ever been found. What is going on in this remote, unexplored wilderness that causes so many people to disappear without a trace. That largely depends on who you ask, and ideas run the gamut from the plausible to the fringe. The area has long been associated with evil spirits in the lore of the native Tlingit people of the region, with one notorious entity being Kushtaka, a shape-shifting demon that is said to look like a cross between man and otter, and is said to lure hapless people to their doom, in particular, those who are lost. Another theory is that the Alaska Triangle comprises one of the so-called vile vortices or geographical areas around the planet postulated by American researcher and cryptozoologist Yvonne T. Sanderson that are claimed to exhibit extreme electric magnetic and electromagnetic anomalies, as well as energy vortexes, also called ley lines, which are theorized subterranean electromagnetic currents. Naturally, the most famous of these vile vortices is the notorious Bermuda Triangle, but they are also said to exist in places as far flung as the Algerian megaliths to the south of Timbuktu, the Indus Valley in Pakistan, Hamakulia Volcano in Hawaii, the Devil's Sea near Japan, the South Atlantic, and both the North and South Poles. Various famous places, such as Stonehenge, Easter Island, and the pyramids in Egypt, are also all said to lie on vortexes, and indeed, it is claimed by some to be the reason that these monuments were erected there in the first place. These energy vortexes are said to create 
all sorts of strange phenomena. They are thought to affect humans in various physical, mental, and emotional ways, such as causing visions, demonstrating miraculous powers of healing, and generating spurts of creativity or profound epiphanies. Many people believe that they can tap into their higher selves when at these vortexes. These places can also allegedly induce disorientation, confusion, and both visual and audio hallucinations, as well as cause delicate electrical instrumentation to go haywire or to malfunction. More far-out theories on energy vortexes are that they are actually doorways into spiritual dimensions, or are gateways to other realms. All of these things could explain why people in vehicles such as ships or airplanes go missing in these regions at such an astonishing rate. There are some interesting things that seem to support the idea that the Alaska Triangle could be one of these vortexes. Alaska is covered with a large concentration of magnetic anomalies, some of which that can disrupt compasses to the point that they are as much as 40 degrees off. In addition, some search and rescue workers in the area have reported having audio hallucinations there, most commonly described as sounding like an angry swarm of bees and of feeling unusually disoriented or lightheaded. Some readings of areas in the supposed Alaska Triangle have indeed produced various unusual anomalies and spikes of electromagnetic activity. Could this have anything to do with the disappearances? Unfortunately, it is unclear whether such vile vortices even truly exist, and the theory has been open to a good amount of skepticism, so it is hard to say for sure. According to authorities, the disappearances are due to a completely different reason altogether. Statistically, Alaska has more annual missing person reports than anywhere else in the country, twice the national average. It also has the highest number of missing people who are never found. In 2007, for instance, 2,833 people were reported missing, and when compared to the state's comparatively low population of around 670,000 people at the time, that equates to about 4 in every 1,000 people, a staggering amount. The reasons for this are many. Alaska has vast swaths of remote wilderness. Over half of the entire nation's federally designated wilderness recognized when the Wilderness Act was passed in 1964, around 57 million acres of it, with even more that is not specifically designated as protected land, and much of this is nearly completely untouched by humans. This harsh landscape is full of all manner of perils, including unforgiving weather, hazardous terrain, dangerous wild animals, and harrowing geological dangers, with Alaska being the home of around 100 active volcanoes. Considering the massive amount of rugged wilderness, which riddled with countless potential hazards, and the fact that many tourists who come here to camp and hike are underprepared, it is perhaps no surprise that a good amount of people may become lost in the middle of nowhere, encounter some danger that incapacitates them and prevents them from getting back to civilization or are just simply killed by wild animals or the elements? Why are the disappearances seemingly more concentrated in the Alaska Triangle than anywhere else in the state? Who knows, but it does cover large areas of some of the most wild and untamed such land in the state. This uncharted wilderness could also explain the number of people who are never found. With the sheer, mind-bogglingly expansive areas of wild inaccessible mountainous land to cover. Search and rescue teams can have a daunting time trying to locate someone. The unpredictable weather and extremely cold winters that are here also limit the times when searches can be conducted. All of which means that finding one person in all of that is a logistical nightmare. Whether the mysterious disappearances of the Alaska Triangle are the result of natural perils, strange energy vortexes, or ancient evil spirits. They are certainly alarming. It is likely we will never come to a complete understanding of the mystery here, and that the only people who will never know for sure are the ones who never came back to tell the tale. And now, we will take a small detour away 
from bizarre beings and visit a bizarre place. Paula Weldon in the Bennington Triangle. I'm going to hike on the long trail. These words were the last that anyone heard from Paula Weldon, the now legendary Bennington College student who disappeared mysteriously 68 years ago. Her story is without a doubt Bennington's most infamous unsolved mystery, and one that continues to appear in New England offers histories of the occult and unexplained. December 1st, 1946, began like any other day in Bennington for Paula Wilbon, an 18-year-old sophomore at the college. She worked two shifts at the school's dining hall, came back to her room, and conversed for a while with her roommate, Elizabeth Johnson. Then, she told Johnson, I'm all through with studies, I'm taking a long walk, and headed out at around 2.45 p.m. According to Johnson's recollections, she was wearing a distinctive red coat with a fur collar, jeans, and lightweight sneakers. Given that it was a cold, though snowless day, and the temperatures were predicted to be sub-freezing by nightfall, she seemed either undressed for a walk in the woods, or was only planning to be out for a short while. That is only one of the unsolved mysteries surrounding Weldon's appearance and behavior that fateful November day. Shortly thereafter, a blonde, slight, red coat clad young woman was seen by Danny Fager, the owner of a gas station that at the time was across the street from the college gates. Fager said that the girl ran up the side of a gravel pit near the college entrance, then ran down it again. Then she went out of view. Later, search parties would call in a bulldozer to sift through the gravel pit on the off chance that she had been buried alive. No evidence was found. Just before 3 p.m., Louis Knapp of Woodford picked up a girl hitchhiking on Route 67A, just outside the college entrance. His description of her matched Weldon. When climbing into his truck, the girl nearly slipped, and Knapp warned her, be careful. No further words were spoken between them until Knapp let her off near his driveway, which was on Route 9, near the long trail, where the girl had told him that she wanted to go. After thanking Knapp for the ride, Weldon headed for the trail. The next sighting of the girl was roughly 45 minutes later in Bickford Hollow, where several residents reported seeing her headed to the trail. One was Ernie Whitman, a watchman for the banner, who warned her about heading up into the mountains, dressed so lightly, and at such a late hour, she continued on anyway into the woods, and out of sight forever. Night fell, and there was no sign of Weldon anywhere. Johnson, her roommate, was reportedly very nervous, but chose not to inform college authorities until the next morning, when college president, Lewis Webster Jones, was notified of Weldon's disappearance. He, in turn, called Weldon's parents to see if she had gone home for the weekend. Weldon's mother reportedly collapsed from shock, and was confined to her bed, while her father, W. Archibald, headed straight for Bennington from their Stanford con home to commence a search for their missing daughter. Weldon's father arrived in Bennington and immediately organized a large group of volunteers from all corners of the community, including local residents and members of both Bennington College and Williams College. Classes at Bennington were suspended so that all students could participate in the search. By the evening of December 2nd, however, the college students had reportedly become frustrated with what they saw as an incompetent search, and they shared their criticism with Weldon's father and President Jones. Weldon, an engineer who was well known in his home state, used his influence to call in state police from New York and Connecticut. At the time, Vermont did not have its own state police force, and the search for Paula Weldon was unfortunately disorganized, and lacking in resources. Vermont did have a state investigator by the name of Alma Franzoni, and within days of Paula's disappearance, he was put on the case. He, along with representatives from the New York and Connecticut police departments, took over the search. Those who had been volunteering to comb the Glastonbury wilderness for Paula switched their efforts to raising money for a reward. Collectively, they raised $5,000. 
Their efforts were to be no avail, however, as the days went by, and there was still no trace of Paula. There were a number of tantalizing and unquestionably strange leads that kept investigators looking, such as the claim by a waitress in Fall River, Mass, that she had served dinner to an agitated young woman at a table who matched Paula's description. This lead struck her father as so promising that he disappeared for 36 hours in order to follow it, without telling anyone of his whereabouts until he returned to Bennington. This led some to point to Weldon as the prime suspect in his daughter's disappearance, a theory made even more compelling by the facts surrounding the week before Paula's disappearance. Apparently, Paula was expected to go home to Connecticut for Thanksgiving, but she called her parents and told them that she would be staying in Bennington. Apparently, according to Johnson, she and her father had a falling out not long before her disappearance, and Johnson retracted her original statement that Paula was not distraught to say that, in fact, she had been quite depressed. Many speculated that Paula's depression was centered around a faraway boyfriend, and her father at one point posited a theory that his daughter had a boy from her hometown who wanted to call on her and could have been a suspect. Mr. Weldon could never provide any evidence to substantiate his claim, however, though he claimed that a clairvoyant from Pownall insinuated a man's involvement in Paula's disappearance. On December 16th, Paula's father packed up his daughter's belongings and returned to Connecticut, but not before lambasting Vermont for its lack of a professional police force. He deplored the alleged irresponsibility of those heading up the search, especially the fact that there had been no records kept of the first 10 days of the investigation. This was not overlooked by the small army of reporters from across New England who had descended upon Bennington to cover the story, and the negative press the state received in the weeks following Paula's disappearance helped lead to the creation of the Vermont State Police in a legislative session in July 1947. As soon as Weldon left, the out-of-state reporters also bid Vermont adieu, although the banner continued to cover the story as front-page news until late December. Volunteer search parties will continue to make expeditions on the long trail, but by early January, harsh weather conditions and lack of hope ended their efforts. Any evidence of Paula Weldon, if it ever existed, was buried under snow and the passage of time. Or was it? In 1955, a lumberjack who had been in Bickford Hollow near the long trail where Paula had disappeared said he had followed a girl fitting Paula's description into the woods. More importantly, he told a friend that he knew where Paula's body was buried. After interest in Paula's case had been revived and the man had been extensively questioned by then-village attorney Reuben Levin, the man admitted that he had been joking and had no knowledge of Paula or her whereabouts. The case remained unsolved and was nearly declared cold until, 13 years later, an unidentified skeleton was found in Adams. Investigators excitedly awaited the results of an analysis on the bones, only to find that they were too old to have possibly been Paula's. Closure once again proved elusive for the Weldons and investigators of the case. After the Adams skeleton, no significant leads were ever uncovered, leading people to formulate their own theories as to what became of the girl. Speculations have been widely varied. From the more practical, she ran off of a boyfriend. She died of exposure in the wilderness. To the paranormal, the most intriguing of theories in the latter category is one that is raised by New England author and occult researcher Joseph Citra. He coined the term the Bennington Triangle to describe an area of southwestern Vermont within which five people disappeared between 1945 in 1950, including Paula. He links these disappearances to a special energy that inhabits the Glastonbury Wilderness Area that attracts visitors from outer space, who most likely snatched up Paula from the subsequent missing persons. For his part, current director of the Vermont State Police, James W. Baker, has no particular theory on Paula's disappearance, 
saying that, since I was not directly involved, I cannot speculate on the case. However, one thing he can say definitively is that the Vermont State Police came into existence because of Paula, and since their inception in 1947, they have been responsible by statute for all wilderness search and rescue missions, noting that states like Maine and New Hampshire have wildlife agencies that do wilderness rescues. Baker said that the Vermont State Police's mandated responsibility to coordinate wilderness search and rescue efforts comes directly out of the Paul Llewellyn case. He also said that just two weeks ago, he was talking with the head of the State Police Search and Rescue Committee and she had expressed interest in researching the case to put, as Baker put it, a new set of eyes on the case. So, is the case of Paula Weldon cold? Technically, yes, says Baker, but it still remains open, should any leads come up. Whether or not any new information emerges, it is unlikely that anyone familiar with Bennington history will be able to head up the long trail and not think of Paula Weldon's ill-fated journey 60 years ago. Vital Statistics at Time of Disappearance Date of birth, October 19th, 1928. Age, 18 years old. Height and weight, 5 foot 5, 122 pounds. Distinguishing characteristics, Caucasian female, blonde hair, blue eyes. Weldon has a grayish colored scar on her left knee, a small scar under her left eyebrow, and a vaccination scar on her right thigh. She has a cleft chin and an upturned nose. Clothing such jewelry description. A red parka with a fur-trimmed hood. Blue jeans, size 6.5 or 7. White top cider sneakers with heavy soles. And a small gold lady's Elgin wristwatch with a narrow black band. The watch has the repairer's marking, 13050 HD, scratched on the inside of a back case. Authorities looked into Wilden's background to see if she might have left of her own accord. She was a good student, majoring in art, but she had lately become less interested in the subject. She found herself drawn to music and botany instead, and may have been thinking of changing major. Although there were reports that she was somewhat depressed at the time of her disappearance, her family and friends said she only had normal problems for a girl her age, and was not unhappy enough to take her own life or run away from home. She had never had a steady boyfriend. She left all of her belongings behind, and her family stated that she was not the type of person to leave without warning. There is also no hard evidence of foul play in Weldon's disappearance, although many believe that she was murdered and buried somewhere near the Long Trail. Missing People in the Bennington Triangle 1945 Middle Rivers was serving as a mountain guide in the area on November 12, 1945. When he was guiding his group back to their camp, he got ahead of the bunch and was never seen again. The event happened near the Long Trail Road, an area that 75-year-old Mide was presumably familiar with. Police and volunteers searched for the man, but no clue to his fate was ever found. 1946, Paula Weldon. 1949, three hunters went missing in the area around 1949, but there is little evidence to back up the claims. 1949, James E. Tefford got on a bus in St. Albans. By the time the bus reached Bennington, he was gone and never to be seen again. 1950, on October 12th, Paul Jepson, an eight-year-old, went missing. His scent was followed by dogs, but it was lost on a highway. 1950, Frieda Lander disappeared on October 28th, 1950, when she was hiking with her cousin. Frida had separated with her cousin to head back to camp to change after getting her clothes wet, but she never returned to the camp. A massive search was mounted by police, volunteers, firemen, and military saw the woman, but nothing turned up until the following May. Her body was found in a field that had been searched extensively in the previous months. Now for another triangle of weirdness, the Bridgewater Triangle. Although not an official vile vortex, the inland Bridgewater Triangle is likely one of the world's most concentrated areas of diverse paranormal reports. Located just 30 miles south of Boston, the
This 200 mile square area has the Massachusetts towns of Abington, Freetown, and Rehoboth at its angles. The town of Bridgewater is located nearly dead center within the triangle, and the area also encompasses six other Massachusetts towns, Rainham, Taunton, Brockton, Mansfield, Norton, and Easton. Mysterious Landmarks The Harkamock Swamp The Harkamock Swamp, a 5,000 plus acre area, lies within the western section of Bridgewater Triangle and is the hub of many paranormal reports. Also the site of an 8,000 year old Native American burial ground. When archaeologists opened the graves of Grassy Inland, the red ochre within the tombs bubbled and then mysteriously disappeared. Photographs taken of the excavation would not develop. The swamp remains shrouded in superstition, called the place where spirits dwell by the Wampanoag tribe of the Native American nation. The Wampanoag avoided the Hakamak Swamp, and the area remains a place filled with foreboding. Dighton Rock On the banks of the Tonton River, Dighton Rock lies across from the grassy island burial grounds of the Hakamak Swamp. Numerous inscriptions of unknown origins are carved into the face of the rock. Although various speculations attribute them to Native Americans, Vikings, and even Phoenicians, their identity has never been specifically determined. Profile Rock Profile Rock is another Bridgewater Triangle landmark that has gained a paranormal reputation. Located in Freetown, from a nearby hill, the rock shows a clear portrait of a Native American face looking out from the stone. Long before Massachusetts colonists arrived, the Wampanoag people considered Profile Rock sacred. Local legends claim that Native American ghost dancers in warrior dress dance around Profile Rock. Anawan Rock, located in Hockamock Swamp along Route 44, Anawan Rock is named for Chief Anawan and is the site where Chief Anawan surrendered to the colonists, ending King Philip's War. Legend says that the angry spirits of Chief Anawan's warriors continue to haunt the area, starting spectral fires and ghost dancing. Bridgewater Triangle Phenomena Paranormal researcher Lauren Coleman, who named the Bridgewater Triangle in the 1970s, revived public attention to the many paranormal reports emanating from the area. Aside from the number and diversity of paranormal reports, what is phenomenal about the Bridgewater Triangle is that the first report of paranormal activity was made over three centuries ago, in 1760. At 10 a.m. on May 10, 1760, a sphere of fire was reported to hover over New England and emit a light so bright that it cast shadows in the morning sun. Reportedly, the light was seen from both Bridgewater and Roxbury. Since then, the area has spawned a diversity of reports that include paranormal events that range from ghost dancers to UFOs to cryptozoological sightings. Bridgewater Triangle UFOs The 1760 report is likely the first documented UFO report on the planet. However, it certainly was not the last UFO report to come out of the Bridgewater Triangle. Halloween 1908 marked another UFO sighting, documented in local newspapers. In 1968, five people claimed that they saw a strange ball of light floating among the trees in a wooded part of Rehoboth. In the 1970s, UFO sightings were frequently reported to occur in different areas of the Bridgewater Triangle. In one 1976 report, two UFOs were seen landing along Route 44 near Tonton. In 1994, a Bridgewater law enforcement officer reported seeing a triangular shaped craft with red and white lights. The town of Rainham frequently receives reports of glowing balls of light floating over the ground at the local dog track. Mysterious Creatures Cryptozoological sightings are numerous and varied in the Bridgewater Triangle. In 1970, Reports of a Bigfoot-like, seven-foot-tall hairy monster and its footprints instigated both the Bridgewater and Massachusetts State Police K-9 unit to conduct a search for a bear. However, neither man nor bear was ever found. 
In 1978, paranormal researcher Joseph M. DeAndrade claims to have observed another such creature as it slowly walked into the brush of the Hockamock Swamp, about 200 yards from his location. He chronicled his sighting in his 1997 book, Passing Strange, True Tales of New England Hauntings and Horrors, 